Welcome everybody. So I'm uh, Marco Rovri. I'm uh, uh, the person in charge of organizing this uh, series of uh, seminar and uh, PI, PI stands for Principal Investigator Stories. And uh, the aim of this uh, series is to, uh, uh, in, to have uh, talented speakers that uh, will, uh, will speak about, uh, will tell us about uh, their experience in uh, uh, transforming their uh, research ideas uh, into uh, successful uh, uh, grants to finance and to fund uh, their research. Uh, this, uh, this series is, uh, um, uh, has been uh, taught and, uh, uh, to provide uh, uh, PhD students uh, uh, a, a mean to uh, learn success stories from very talented person. And uh, <clears throat> as uh, you have seen from the, from the different uh, communication that have been circulated around, uh, this, uh, this series of seminars is uh, uh, open to PhD students, undergraduate, undergraduates, and uh, uh, master students uh, enrolled at uh, the Department on uh, uh, Information Engineering and Computer Science at the University of Trento, as well as to other people that can be interested in this, uh, in this uh, set of uh, uh, seminars. Uh, just a, a small remark for the, for the PhD students, uh, I think it's uh, from the institutional point of view, uh, this message, is to inform that uh, these uh, uh, the, the students have they they shall attend at least three seminars among uh, the one organized by the, the doctoral school uh, or by the department of computer science, and uh, these series belong to this uh, uh, to this pool of seminars they can uh, they can choose and uh, they are strongly recommended to to attend these uh, these kind of seminars. Um, so far, we have uh, organized the first uh, uh, five uh, uh, seminars that cover the period from uh, February till uh, June. Uh, we uh, already have uh, the, the set of speakers that uh, will, uh, will introduce their, uh, their research uh, and uh, they tell us about their success stories. So the first one is uh, today by, given by Marianne Versel. From the Catholic University of Leuven, and uh, and then we will see in March, April, and May, and June other researchers that will uh, tell us uh, this their, their experience. Uh, as I anticipated, so today is uh, 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 is uh, an honor for us to have here uh, Marianne Verest. Uh, I give the uh, the token to uh, Giovanni uh, Yacca um, that. Uh, <clears throat> presented uh, the candidature for, for, for Marianne, and they can introduce that. So yes. Giovanni, please. Uh... Yes, thanks Marco, and I will be very brief. Uh, it's a very great pleasure for me to introduce you, Professor Marianne Ferrells. Uh, Marianne is a, an associate professor at the uh, Mika's Laboratories of the Electrical um, uh, Engineering Department at the Catholic University in, in Leuven. She has a strong background in embedded mach uh, machine learning, embedded systems, and she's involved uh, in a number of uh, uh, top conferences. Uh, she's in executive committees, for instance, of uh, DATE and uh, ISSCC. Uh, she's also involved uh, in the uh, um, uh, Tiny ML uh, 2021, uh, and she got uh, uh, quite some prestigious uh, um, um, awards, uh, and uh, she's involved in, in, in several um, uh, projects at the uh, uh, European level, among which uh, uh, she uh, uh, is currently in charge of an ERC starting grant. And uh, she was also working in a FET open project, uh, which I believe are the two main projects she will talk about today. And yes, that, that will be it. I won't steal too much time uh, from Marianne. So please, Marianne, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot for inviting me. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, Voilà. You can see my screen? Yes. Yep. Okay. So thanks a lot for inviting me. It's an honor to be here today and talk a bit about my uh, research experience or how I like to manage things. It's very different than the talks I normally give, which are highly technical, but I think it's also nice that we can share this kind of experiences. So thank you. So um, in um, addition to the intro given by Giovanni, what I briefly want to say is I'm a professor now in Leuven uh, here in Europe. Uh, I also worked for three years in Intel Labs in Oregon in the United States, 
And um, I also did my PhD in Leuven. So I kind of went from Europe to the west coast of the US and after three years back to Belgium. I'm also affiliated with IMAC at the moment and my research both at the university and at IMAC is really focusing on machine learning, especially embedding machine learning on chip with low power, um, low power consumption and doing innovations on processor architectures, adaptive processing and things like that. While it's of course not the content of today's talk, you will see this come back because that's where my research is in. But what I want to talk to you about today is more the broader context. How do I then sell this research and how do I try to make it successful? Um, just as a starting point, eh, the whole goal of the, my, my team, the researchers that I try to lead is basically enable teeny tiny devices that can be a smartwatch, a smart glasses, uh, whatever, small devices with small batteries, enable them to be intelligent, to do or to experience what is going on around them, to understand context, context, and to react to the needs of the people around them. And this not by sending all their data to the cloud and let the cloud process it and give back some processed information. No, instead, by really letting these devices process it themselves. And of course, you can do or optimize this in many ways. You can start to design new algorithms, but that's not what my team does. What we especially do is we make computer chips as eh? so a small pieces of silicon. Let me get a pointer. Small pieces of silicon like the one you see here, eh? they fit on the top of a finger or they're the size of a fingernail and they're full processors that can process information at real time without draining my battery. We also do work a bit at the algorithmic level, but only to the extent that we um, uh, tweak the algorithms a bit to be easier or better fit for a processor. And most of the work happens on computer architecture level and, and chip layout. So in my lab, we have taped out many chips throughout the years. Uh, this, each of these looks like big things, but they're just less than a centimeter by a centimeter. And most of them are just a few millimeters by a few millimeters. So very small pieces of silicon, but with a lot of innovation inside. And in my lab, we tape out a couple of chips every single year. And of course, then try to publish these. Now, the people that do this is not me. Eh? I'm a professor. Uh, although I like to do research, I seldomly get to do research myself anymore, which on one hand, I find sad. On the other hand, I do enjoy uh, doing not just one specific part of the research, but more supervising many different young people that are operating in this area of efficient machine learning and going in all different kinds of directions. So this is um, me standing in the middle and in front of my team. Uh, it's already a picture of a few years ago. Uh, that's how we looked back then. And this is how we look today, all with the masks. Um, but what you can see, it's a broad team. It is also a diverse team. So you have really, in my team, pure low-level chip designers that are doing gate-level optimizations. Some other people are more architecture people thinking of a novel computer architecture, uh, coding it some high, in some high-level language. Other people are not even making chips, but they basically make tools to do very fast exploration of the design space. A tools that will predict if you would make a chip in this and this and this manner, what would be the expected performance so that we can iterate faster on our design. And finally, there's people working more at the algorithms, not for the algorithm innovation themselves, but to see what are the requirements from algorithms that are currently not well covered by existing machine learning processors. So you see, to do this kind of work, you really need a, a, a diverse team that has a bit both skills from the software side, skills from the hardware side, skills from chip fabrication, the backend design of the chip side, and so on. And that's a bit the reason I ended up with such a big team. Um, because if you need a bit of everything, you easily end up with 10 people or more. And all of them are PhD students in my lab, except for one postdoc and two uh, graduate or, or, or master students. Um, of course, it's also a challenge then to manage this bigger group. Uh, I don't have specific slides on that, but we can definitely in the discussion afterwards also cover that part a bit. Um, 
So what I prepared for you is really a presentation um, of a roughly 35, 40 minutes on how I uh, try to build out this group, how I attract funds for the projects that I like the most and how I then, then manage these kind of projects and how I um, basically ensure there is continuous follow-up projects. And I told you, I wanna talk about the projects I like the most. The question is, okay, because that's what, where you like to spend your time and no one likes to do administration. No one likes to do a boring engineering project where you just have to do the job. No, what we all like to do is projects that excite us, that challenge us, that, that make us go crazy, but then we find the solution and, and we're super happy that we find this unique new thing. That's what excites you, what makes you interested in, and go for your job. And to me, these two pictures summarize what it means. On the one hand, you wanna do something special. You wanna go, let's go start here on the right. You wanna go to a place where there is not everyone. Eh? In my world, this machine learning, I make chips for machine learning. A couple years, let's say five years ago, I was making machine learning processors and it was wonderful because there was almost no one doing this and we made a chip and everyone say, oh, it's amazing. You make a machine learning chip. Now, if you make a machine learning chip, people say another machine learning chip. We already have so many. What's interesting about it? So as soon as a research area gets a bit crowded, it becomes difficult to stand out, to be do something else than everyone is doing. So you should try to find your unique spot, a spot where you can really be excelling, where you can stand out, where people will recognize you, you're the pioneer. But to find that unique spot, of course, is not easy because to find that unique spot, uh, you have to have an idea that, that people maybe haven't thought about. How to get this? Well, there is in fact two ways to get there. You have to do both of them. First of all, you have to go the extra mile. You have to do efforts, you have to invest time, you have to invest thinking, you have to do the extra effort that maybe not everyone has time or money or for to do or has energy to do. So you do have to actively go and look and push beyond where others might have given up. And this is difficult, this is going out of your comfort zone. It maybe means doing something you never did before, learning something about an adjacent field that you don't know yet, because only if you push out of your comfort zone, you do this extra thing that other people might not do, then you can go where the magic happens. So for me, this is key in day-to-day -day working. Try to go the extra mile. Keep pushing, keep going for whatever you do. Try to do everything you go better, even better than you thought you could do it. And then you can do exciting projects and it means that then you can do projects that bring you and allow you to think for far ahead, that really allow you to push a grander vision and not just make the next neural network chip, but say that I wanna work on the, in my case, the compute architecture for the computational devices 10 years from now. It will not be a smartphone, it will not be a smartwatch, that's today. It might be another thing that is inside me or carrying or whatever with me 10 years from now, what would that be? And that requires a different mindset than trying to solve the engineering problem of a company today. So this grander vision, pushing beyond uh, going the next extra mile, I think that is what allows you to have a lasting impact and, and also what can push yourself to keep going and, and can drive yourself. Now, if you want to have projects that are going after this grander vision, that are really having a more lasting impact, where you have the feeling you're changing the future and not just changing today, it of course means that I need to have a project in which I can do such far out future looking research that excites me and that makes me do different things than other people do. These are the high risk, potentially high gain projects. And these are projects that idea ideally are open-ended, they're undirected. I cannot perfectly predict what the future will bring. I don't know how this computational device 10 years from now, whether it's somewhere in my brain or in a drone or, or wherever, I don't know how it will look. I don't know yet what algorithms it has to execute, 
but I can dream of them and I can try to explore and, 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 and come with answers. But I don't want a milestone next month and another milestone three months from now and delivery to a company five months from now. Then I cannot think about this long-term plan. So this ideal far out project is a bit open-ended. It gives me time to think, to freewheel. It gives me time to go in a wrong direction and even come back, have fail, try, fail, and come back and restart. Where I don't have to do constantly reporting, where I don't have too many deliverables, and where I can even be slightly crazy. And as soon as, as long as at the end I have this great idea, it was okay that I was crazy. This brought me to the great idea. So this is a very different kind of project that we often do a short term with a company or some, some, some local consortia and so on. And if you ask any researcher what they like the most, I think 95% of them, especially the people that decide to stay in academia, this is what excites them. This is what keeps you going. This is why you are happy to go this extra mile every single day is this long-term vision and the feeling you can have this long-term impact. Of course, the challenge is, it's great that you wanna do this. It's great if everyone finds the energy to go after these big problems, but you have to get the money. Otherwise, you cannot do them. Eh? Also for me, I have a large team, but they can only keep going if I can pay their salaries at the end of the month. So as a professor and, and also you eh, as, as researchers, if you want to do these high-risk, high-gain projects, yes, go for it. But we'll have to discuss a bit how you have to make sure you're, you're, you're ready to go for them, meaning that you have the grants to do them, you can manage them, and you can make sure they keep coming. So that's exactly what I want to discuss in this talk. Eh? First of all, if we have such high-risk, high-gain projects, what did I do from my own experience uh, to basically pass the proposal stage, to get the money to do these kind of projects. Next, use the money. It's always fun, but still it's a challenge for these kind of projects. How do you manage them and keep them on track? And first of all, if the project is over or even before the project is over, how do we make sure this money pays off and gives you new money to do the next big thing? So these three stages of projects uh, I want to discuss, and I will do it uh, to not make it too abstract and, and high level and, and, and irrelevant, I mean, um, unrealistic. I want to do them based on two projects that I have done, uh, I'm still doing in my uh, recent career. One is the Phoenix project, by the way, one that I was in with Giovanni here. Uh, it's a fat open European project. And one is the Recents project, which is my own ERC starting that. Okay, so we'll start by getting the money. And maybe many of you are not professors, but you are PhD researchers or even just young academics. Even for them, you have to get the money. Then getting the money might not be write a proposal for the ERC, but getting the money might mean that you have to convince a professor to take you as a PhD student. And also then you have to sell yourself. So this, don't only see this getting the money as the professor job, all principles I will discuss, you can also apply to yourself if you're a PhD researcher um, or if you're a master's student that wants to go to a PhD and so on. So getting the money for these high risk, high gain IDs. You might think that this is very difficult in Europe um, because there is not that much research money and so on. But I think the opposite is true. This funding is very, very competitive, so it's not easy to get it, but at least Europe has funding mechanisms to pay such research. It's more difficult in some other places in the world. We have, first of all, of course, the ERC. This is truly open, undirected research money where you can come with your crazy ID and if they like it, they will fund it. And I was so lucky to get one fund. Of course, the chances of acceptance are not that high. You also have the FED funding, uh, future emerging technology. Also, that is for crazy bottom-up research, also a lower chance of acceptance, but it exists, and I will tell you how you can maximize your chances. But of course, if you're a PhD student, it basically means landing with the right professor that can fund or do the kind of ideas that excites you. So this applies to all of them. 
but it starts from having an ID and trying to sell it into one of these funding schemes. And I think there are four ingredients or four things you can try to do to get such a crazy research ID or a far out research ID funded. And I listed them here. One, dream big, have a story for a broad audience. Two, write yourself into the proposal. Three, go across domains and use your peers. And four, keep trying. Don't give up to iteration. So on each of them, I'll show you um, some more details and a few examples for my own projects. So I'll start with number one. Dream big, have a story for a broad audience. If you're gonna go up for this kind of funding, what you will see is that you have a very interdisciplinary jury typically. If you go for a short term project in a very specific area of science, you typically come in front of an expert jury, a jury that knows is experts in your field and they will rate your proposal, one type of project. If you go for this kind of high risk, high gain, whether it's FED funding, ERC funding or other kind of funding, the jury is typically much more broad because they're bottom-up research IDs. Research IDs can come in from any angle, any discipline, and they all come together in only a limited number of juries. For example, for ERC, my proposal uh, was submitted in the, uh, I think it's called EE6 or something, the ICT uh, area, but there is both people doing like theoretical, um, machine learning theory and, and proofs and so on, mathematical proofs. There were people working on computer architectures like me, but also people working just on signal processing, uh, people working on feedback machines and stability of loops and, and, and many, many the visualization, everything. Uh, it seems for me, it was still a humongously broad field of experts that I would have to go in front of. And this is typically the case, a pretty interdisciplinary jury. If you sell your story to such a jury, you would think that you should try to convince the people that know your field. And for me, I could have thought, I have to try to convince the machine learning uh, computer architecture experts, so my niche field. The opposite is true. The people that are in your field and that are in this jury, they will probably like your proposal. You know your, you know your field, you know what is hot, if it excites you, it's probably exciting them. Typically, these people are already convinced. You don't have to worry about them. But the person that will get the grant is the person that convinces the other experts that are less an expert on your topic, but that are more broad jury people. If they're happy, then probably uh, the experts are happy already. That's what gets you the grant. So, Basically, the message is have a story that doesn't only appeal to experts, have a story that appeals to the adjacent experts, the, the, less, the so, somewhat less experts of your field. And let me make this very concrete by my two projects. First of all, Phoenix and then Recense. And for Phoenix, um, very broad, briefly, um, the idea in Phoenix was to make uh, electrical equipment, hardware that allows us to um, explore and, and um, explore and sense and measure environments where humans cannot go. Think about an underground river or a pipeline system or an oil, oil well, like you see here. Eh? The oil is some hundreds of meters under the soil. I cannot even send equipment in there because I don't have any radiation from here to the surface of the earth. I, I have a hard time accessing this. So the idea in Phoenix, the Phoenix project, the FED project with multiple partners was, we're gonna make small sensor balls. They look like this. And we're gonna send them inside the system. They're gonna do some measurements and they come back and I can see what they measured and I can hence know what went on under the soil. Okay, um, I guess the people that are interested in electronics might see that it's a challenge to make your hardware very small. And maybe some people that are doing sensor processing might realize that it's a lot of data. It sounds like an okay project, but this is not super cool. And I don't know why a general person would get extremely excited about it. There is 
a story, but it's not a very attractive story. So we submitted this FED project and it didn't make it. The project failed. We did not get the grant. Yeah, because the challenge was on having flexible hardware that is small and it, it was a pure electrical challenge. We want to make the sensor system so that it can sense many things and it should be small and low power, very good challenges, but two technical in-field expert challenges. But we tried again. Uh, we, um, by the way, at that time the project wasn't called Phoenix. It had another name, I already forgot it. And you realize later why it didn't or well, the name was not Phoenix yet. So we went again and we changed the story of the whole proposal. We still have the same goal. We want to explore the unexplorable. We want to be able to reach inaccessible environments. They can be oil wells, underground rivers. It could be another planet in our universe. It could be even parts in our body where we can normally not go, inside our veins, whatever. It can be exploring any area where you cannot go. You have to do that with sensory agents, but we do not even know how to design these agents. The agents, the agents will have to be very flexible. I sent them inside my unknown environment where they start to measure. But while they are measuring, they also change their behavior gradually. And they see with what behavior they extract more or less information. And when these agents come out of this pipeline because they come back up, I will look at them. I will see what data they collected. And based on this, I will refine my knowledge about the environment. I will create a virtual world. And this virtual world, I will now use to train better generations of agents. So these agents, they come out, they're broken down again and in a virtual training loop, I keep improving with evolutionary algorithms my agents and a new generation of agent arises. Like a phoenix, that's the name, that arranges from the ashes of the previous phoenix, a new phoenix arrives, a new sensor device arises, which I can push down back into my system, back into my oil well. This is a generation of hardware that creates instincts, that learns, that evolves over time where hardware can make itself better over and over generations. And a human does not have to design the system anymore, but the hardware will self-optimize over time. And this is the key innovation and breakthrough that allows you to explore unexplorable environments. You see, the system we're building in the two projects is pretty similar. But the way how you sell it and you give it this unique nature, unique angle to a broader audience is very different. And this time we got the grant and we did very interesting research. But maybe we would have done that in the first definition as well. But it's a very big difference in how you sell it. Second example, my ERC project recents. Also that one failed the first time I went for this grant. In my ERC project recent, what I wanted to build was extremely low power um, systems for acoustic and image processing, where you want to co-optimize the processing on chip, both the hardware, the algorithms, and the sensor system, so that the hardware can control when to turn on and off a sensor. I was gonna use some probabilistic machine learning to determine when I have to turn sensors on and off. I had great technical ideas. I still think the proposal was technically sound, but it was not, it was good for my expert colleagues. They liked it, but the general jury didn't really think it was that special or unique or deserving an ERC. So I tried again and I changed my story. And in my new ERC project, I said to my jury in my oral interview, I said, did you ever notice that if you talk to someone and now you're listening to me, you're listening with your ears, but you're also watching with your eyes. You're watching with your eyes to my mouth. And this visual information allows you to understand me better. And interestingly enough, if we go in a very busy room, a crowded place, a bar, 
you will start to focus less on your ears and more on your eyes. You're trying to understand me better by watching my lips more. And you shift your attention from my ears to my eyes. And if you're in a phone call and you will hardly hear me, you might even squeeze your eyes to fully focus on your ears and hear me better. So again, you shift your attention to your other sensors. As a human, we constantly, dynamically tune our attention, tune our computational power to the sensor that gives us the biggest amount of information. And this is very flexible and context adaptive. At the moment, only living species, humans and animals, can do this sensory attention tunability. They can dynamically change their compute power, their attention, their, their, their power consumption from one sensor to another. Electronics cannot do this. They always listen to everything at the same extent. I want to make in this project self-tunable sensory systems and processing systems that can use this attention tunability to be super power efficient, yet capture all required information for the maximum amount of information at any moment in time. How will I do this? Ha, this is the same proposal as last year, but it is now put in a very different storyline. And now the general public sees that I'm making or trying to mimic some of this unique human behavior to make our electronics better. And I got the grant. So I hope with these two examples, you see a bit that having a good idea is not enough. Uh, technically, it should be sound, no questions asked, but that's the start. And then you have to sell it to a broader jury. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a bit weird to give a talk without seeing people or getting the reactions, but I continue. Feel free to interrupt me if things are not clear. Or we have ample time also for questions at the end. That's at least the idea. Um, then, second point, write yourself into a proposal. If you write a proposal, of course, we can write a lot of technicalities. We have to. And then typically there is a section about the PI. Uh, who is the PI and, and why am I fit for the project? Do not only sell yourself in that section. As a PI, of course, you have to sell yourself there, but you have to sell yourself, your profile in any part of the proposal. If you talk about the state of the art, make sure that your contribution up to now in the state of the art is clear, that you are part of the state of the art section. If you write about your ID, your new concept, make it clear that this new concept requires a unique skill set, a unique set of combined skills that, by coincidence, you're one of the few people that has it. If you talk about infrastructure, make it clear that this is the infrastructure that needed and that you have one of the unique places that have this infrastructure. So make sure that you bring out um, your uniqueness, not only in one place in the proposal at the end, but throughout the whole proposal. Um, I see already a, a few comments in the chat. Let, I, let me uh, go through the rest of the proposal stage. You can add some questions there in the meantime, and then I will answer them, and then I'll continue with the other phases. So that's very good. That makes it a bit more interactive. Third axis, our third ingredient for such a project. Being unique, as I said in the beginning, it's not easy. For machine learning processors, uh, maybe five years ago, there were few people active. At this moment, it's overcrowded. There is hundreds or maybe thousands of researchers trying to push the same goal. By doing the same as they do, it will be hard for me to do something interesting. I'm maybe, I'm not better than most of them. I'm not smarter than most of them. I just have to try to focus on some place where it's not too crowded yet and where I can make a difference because I have a unique skill set. And to be honest, I even don't have a unique skill set. I'm not more skilled than other people, but what I do have is, and what I do think is important, I have a good network. So you can, it's easy to become unique, but you don't have to try to be unique yourself. It can, it's easier to become unique by just teaming up with some interesting combination of people. So don't do everything yourself. 
try to work cross-disciplinary. It's an, a good way to be different than other people. And but this is best to team up with some other people from another discipline that have aligned visions and, and, and a, a complementary uh, skill set with an aligned interest. And also that I can illustrate from the different proposals that are a project I worked on. First of all, the Phoenix project, uh, you, hear, you heard my story earlier. Well, to realize such a thing, you need, uh, that would be needed, people that make chips, but these chips had to be integrated into these sensory balls, bigger systems. We had to post-process all this data, which required some kind of supercomputing. We needed evolutionary algorithms in this loop to optimize the sensor nodes every generation in time. We had to new studies to see how you have to interface with such a population of electronic data and how you bring in your questions and, and your expert information and so on. Very different skill sets. Yet a project like this, a FED project, allows to bring such different people together. So if you go for such funding, try to not just invite your friends from your field that's, you, that all go to the same conferences and do the same kind of research. No, use this kind of project to bring together a group of people that all attend a different kind of pro con conference because they're all in a different field. And then it's already a straight, more straightforward way to make it unique. The same for my ERC project. An ERC project is an individual project. You're supposed to do it alone, being the PI, without needing other people. Yet, there's ways around this, and I would even recommend not to try to do it alone, because again, you can think more broadly, more free, freely, you can be more unique. For example, when I started my ERC, I was not that big in machine learning yet. I had done a bit of work, but I was not that well recognized for it. Yet I want to get the grant, so I had to build up credibility. And I knew machine learning was my weak spot. So within my ERC project, although they couldn't be officially part of the project, I still teamed up with computer science um, researchers. One of them was a computer science postdoc in my own um, department, not my own department, my own university, another department in my university. And I agreed with him that I would pay him like 10% uh, of his time from my ERC grant, if I got the grant, to help me guide on the ML part of the project. And that gave me already some credibility. And on top of that, I teamed up with researchers at UCLA that would like to use my research or outcome of the ERC project. And they wrote letters of support and we had some agreements on exchanging students in internships and so on. And this helped. And this allowed me to add this interdisciplinary nature. Last advice is don't give up. You see, I gave two very competitive High risk, high gain projects, but both of them I first failed. I tried twice for the FED funding. I even tried three times for the ERC funding. Of course, the second and third time it's less work because you iterate on your proposal. But don't throw out a good idea. The first time it's probably not perfect, but you just make it better. And you have to make it better by sending it to many, many, many people and discussing and discussing again and again and again. For example, for my ERC project, the last time I did mock interviews with at least five different groups. I did a mock interview in a computer science research group. I did a mock interview in electrical engineering research group. I did a mock interview with students. I did a mock interview with professors. They all had different kinds of questions across disciplines, which prepares you for the broad panel. I let at least 10 people read my short version of my proposal. And they all had very conflicting comments. And I tried, so go that extra mile also holds here. Don't give up too easily. At the end, you'll get um, your way. Okay, um, before I go to the second stage, let me quickly um, check for some questions that popped up. Um, one question is thinking big is fine, but it should also be realizable in the project. Um, of course, I, uh, and how can I uh, comment on that? Of course, it has to be realizable, yet your big vision doesn't have to be realizable. And with that, I mean, 
if I sketch a future that's maybe 15 years out and people get excited by it and believe it, they might be fine if I say, and now I will realize the first step of this big vision. That's already an important step because these and these and these are the most crucial uh, hurdles that we have to overcome. And I'm going to tackle that to open the way to this grander vision. That's a bit how I played it. So by no means at the end of my ERC, I would say that I made something that mimics the brain of a human. But I said that the key problem to get to this is that you need this dynamic scalability, which boils down into this and this and this technical stuff. And this, these two are the most difficult, so I will tackle them in the project. So my recommendation is give the big vision, uh, show people that this future has certain technical hurdles, and then decide to tackle a few of these hurdles in the path to the big vision. And then people know why you're doing it, and it gives you this grand uh, opening, and at the same time, the realism. Second question, uh, the last EU calls uh, require a clear realization path and a measurable impact. Yes, also here, I use a bit this duality. So I always try to have this long-term impact, but I also try to make sure I indicate the short-term impact. And let me use the ERC again as an example. This is the grand vision of the future, fully flexible, self-organizing sensors like our brain. But what I did in the project along the way is I made a very low power keyword spotter that can detect keywords in a phone, like the Hey, hey Alexa or Hey Google or Siri Wake Up. This device already now or is now an industrial collaboration with a partner. So even a big project with a grand vision where you tackle some technical hurdles, well, every technical hurdle you overcome can be a spin out that can already have a, a short term impact while you still also go for your long-term goal. So again, the two doesn't have, don't have to be conflicting. Did I ever try, in my last question, did I ever try to request funding directly from industry? Yes, I do. And I will uh, hold that question because I talk about it in the last stage about my funding pipeline. Typically, I try to do these kind of long-term projects. And with the spin-outs of that project, I try to get some follow-up industry funding. But I will come back to it. And you can ask again at the end of the talk if you have more questions. OK. Oh, I see I'm running out of time. <clears throat> OK, I will go very fast now because this is the easier stages. Using the money, what do I do in these um, stage once I have the project? I think a couple of important things. You cannot do it all. Uh, have to focus. And we, even if you have the grand vision, focus on some things you will actually execute. Choose your loved ones, love your choice. Stick with the plan. And again, don't do it alone, but know your weaknesses and team up with others. And my example here, eh, I do a lot of digital chips. I'm very good at that, but I'm not good at analog. Yet all the chips you see here had analog components on them. They were published at ISSCC, which is a very highly rated conference. But I didn't do them alone. One was made with guys in Stanford, another with guys in IMEC, and so on and so on. So team up. Everyone else in the world are not competitors. They are potential collaborators. I see all my colleagues as friends and collaborators and never as a competition, even not if they're better than me. Many of them are better than me, which means I like to work with them. If you cannot do it all, you have to work with others. And that means you have to speak the same language. And this is difficult. I have projects with bioengineers. I have uh, projects with theoretical machine learning people. And in the beginning, I don't understand them. I don't understand them at all. And it takes like a year that I don't understand them. They use the same words as I use, but for different things and different concepts. So you have to take this time to explain them what you mean with a certain term and what they mean. And you have to meet and meet again. And this is really important. But it's needed, especially in these interdisciplinary projects like the FET ones and so on, to keep your vision aligned. If you don't have this grander vision and you still are going after the same thing, everyone in the project just starts to do something different. And that's important. And it also means that sometimes you have to do something that is maybe not the most interesting research for you at the time, but it's just some 
interface block you have to make or something to keep linking to the other guy. It's not fun maybe, but it's a matter of giving and taking. You do it now and next time someone else will do something for you. You invest sometimes in the success of another guy and he will invest back in your success somewhere, sometime later. It always pays back. My ingredients then eh, to realize or overcome these challenges, I try to be always extremely positive and energetic. I think for my PhD team, this is important. It, they have so many daily challenges and struggles and chips that don't work and algorithms that fail. I am the positive one that believes in them, keeps going, tries to be with a good positive attitude to everyone. And as I said to my competitors, but I don't have them, to success of colleagues, to success of other people in the field, to success of my own students and celebrate every little success we have. And I said it, know your weaknesses, team up. We discussed that. And then my personal problem is that I always micromanage. Um, I think it's important to not do it too much and let your team members and colleagues deviate from the grander goal from time to time, as long as it's controlled and you can kill your darling. So after some time, you can say, stop, this was enough. Go back. Yeah, I'm going to skip this to leave some time for questions. Let me quickly dive into the chat again. Mm. For ARC, if you fail, you need to wait some time before resubmitting. Um, that's true. Um, I had the chance to never fail that much that I could not reapply. So it depends how much you fail, whether you can reapply or not. Um, Anyway, if a project is not good enough to go through the first round, it's probably a good idea to take two years to resubmit anyway. Because by the time you know that you fail, there is only like six months left to resubmit. Six months is not enough to get an ERC project right. It really requires lots of discussions with many people, many drafts of your proposal, shared, discussed. So... I think it's a good thing, but don't wait one year to revive it then. Start immediately. Okay, brings me to the last part here. Uh, question on industrial money. So of course, if the project is over or almost over, um, you have to think about the next thing because a good project leads to new projects. And ideally such high risk, high gain project leads to some maybe industrial projects. So I strongly believe in what we call in my university, the research pipeline, where you have some more high risk, high gain, conceptual far out projects, which should lead to more um, mature, maturization projects that make technology more ready for industry. And then you have more applied research in close collaboration with industrial partners. And you have this conceptual maturization and industry transfer kind of projects. And it's important that you have a pipeline of this, that at any given moment in time, as a principal investigator, you have some of these blue and cyan and green things going on in parallel. Basically for me, the green projects pay the bills of the next blue projects because the industrial projects bring good money. And with that, I can maybe let some new researchers start some crazy ID with which I can apply for my next ERC funding for example. So having a pipeline in this fashion, where basically every stage can spin out and lead to some more mature research. And that can again fund some new crazy ideas. That is important. And it does mean that you have to think ahead. Don't start when your ERC project is over. You should not start thinking about the next funding. It should already during the project Every time you see something that can be spun out and like my keyword spotter can come out of my ERC or here and start an industrial project or some other project can start and already do some national funding with it. So it requires to think ahead during the project, constantly look for partners and cross fertilization. A spin out partially, partial ideas to always keep your research pipeline diverse and filled. And again, this is my last um, uh, content slide here. If I apply this to my projects, my ERC was partly inspired by the Phoenix project. So it's like a fundamental project spun out of a fundamental project. 
within the Phoenix project, some companies uh, started to mature the ID and now there is a startup doing some smart balls, smart marbles. I mean, there is a company commercializing this, not me, but someone else. But for me, I did some national funding with the resulting IDs and we're even thinking of an own startup here. What comes out of the reasons, I do research project in collaboration with Intel and Huawei, um, some more advanced research with Intel, and we start to brainstorm, or I start to brainstorm about the next ERC. So you see how this whole pipeline with a mix of these different maturity projects, I try to always keep it built. Voilà, brings me to the end. I hope I showed you a bit how I try to push myself out of my comfort zone, keep going the extra mile to basically do the research I want to do, that be the center of the party that I want to attend. So I'm sorry I talked maybe much longer than I was planned, uh, but feel free to bombard me with questions. I will already uh, answer this one in the chat, but you can also speak up and, and ask more of them. Yes, thanks, um, Marianne, for the very inspiring talk. Very, very interesting. Um, I see there is one other question also from Kahim. It may happen that the proposal stage your idea is appropriated by someone. How to deal with these uh, patents? So how do you... Uh, you mean with appropriated, you, you, you mean form? that someone else already patented it or it's from someone else? Or no, or your idea is stolen by someone else. So what, uh, Oh, okay. Uh, I never had this problem, to be honest. Um, I think also typically in a proposal, your ideas are so broad still. By the time you actually execute the project, I've changed my mind a couple of times of how I, I still have the same big vision, but how exactly I'm gonna do it, which is the patentable part of it, that changes a couple of times along the way. I'm not too concerned about that, to be honest. For me, patents are something from a company. When something's very mature, we exactly know how we do it. They can patent it and pay for it or, or get the money. As a researcher, there is like a thousand ways how I can realize a, a bigger concept. It never bothers me that there would be a patent. I never had that problem, let me state. Mm -hmm. yeah, I also never patent myself. There's only one place where I patented myself, which is now for something we have a startup ID for. Otherwise, I always let a company patent, and as long as I have a good research contract with them, that's good for me. Okay. Uh, I don't see any other question in the chat for now. Uh, so maybe in the meantime, while we wait for some other questions, I can ask you some something. I don't know, Mark, if you have other questions. But what I wanted to ask you is, uh, well, two questions, actually. One is, uh, um, okay, you have shown this pipeline uh, of funds uh, that it looks very, very nice, especially if you are successful, uh, as in your case, you know, you, you can have, you can, uh, you can uh, afford them in something like that, you know, having uh, uh, one main uh, big uh, crazy idea and then some uh, spin out. But what happens if you fail at the very beginning, so you cannot create this pipeline uh, to begin with? I did, no. I did. I mean, this works indeed good for me, like this now. Mm -hmm. I'm a professor now for eight years. The first three years I failed so much. So I was, it was, yeah, you start small. I started with two PhD students, which luckily one of them, my colleagues paid for me. So I had very good research group that gave me some credit, let's say. And you start small and you start with one small project, but still it doesn't mean you cannot think big. Even in these small projects, have the big vision. It's okay that you dream with a big vision that needs like eight PhD students. But if you can then indicate, convince people of this big vision and indicate that the biggest challenge lies in this starting point and I'm gonna tackle that, you can already get that on the road. And this then again leads you to credibility in this space and you can have maybe two projects next. And for me, it started like small, Mm -hmm. where I still try to have the same bigger idea and vision, but I could only tackle a very small part of it. And now I'm lucky that I can tackle more parts. And then of course, indeed, maybe it's a luxury situation, but then you have to force yourself to still keep doing the long-term stuff and not only the industry projects here and there. That's the message I want to give here. Yes, especially for uh, something like the ERC, which I think has a success rate of approximately 10% or even less, or the ERC or the FET is like 2 to 3%. So, so someone might even think that it doesn't pay off. Uh, we spend a lot of time preparing the grant, something like, uh, like thinking about it, uh, talking to people and so on, and then eventually yeah. you don't get it. 
it might seem like a waste of time, right? Yeah, and uh, my answer there is, it is not a waste of time because going for an ERC proposal forces you to create your big ID. And this big ID is a vision that your whole research will rely on for the next seven years or so. So the ERC proposal is one spin out of your thinking process. But the thinking process, even if my ERC didn't make it the first times, uh, it helped a lot to define where I want to go, what my colleagues thought of this direction, what people found a good idea, bad idea. I gained so much information about a good research direction just from the process, even if I didn't get the grant. And this resulted, by the way, in a couple of sites, grants, uh, proposals that I wrote to less competitive funding, where I kind of spun out a small part of this idea and already asked for a proposal on that. And even though my ERC didn't make it in the beginning, these small projects sometimes made it because I taught them too well while thinking about my ERC. So it is worth it. Even if you don't get the ERC, the whole process, I think, is worth the time you invest. Yeah. Because you use it in other places. Yeah. I have one other question. I don't know if uh, somebody else has, otherwise... Uh... I will ask you, so about the cross-fertilization, uh, because one of the key success, as you said, is to have uh, uh, as multidisciplinarity as possible, right? yeah. especially in this kind of project like the FET, FET Open and similar calls. So for a young uh, researcher, I think it's a bit harder to, to get into these uh, uh, multidisciplinary uh, settings because maybe you end up attending all the same conferences, you, you, you you know very well the people from your community, but you don't know the other people from mm -hmm. other communities. So how do you reach to them? So how, do, how can you expand your community? Yeah, yeah. what I did is, I, I, yes, I had exactly the same problem, obviously. Mm -hmm. What I did is I just started within my own university. So I had an ID, for example, it's a biomedical thing. We had some ideas to do some electronics for microorganisms. It's not in this um, slide set, but okay. And I didn't know anyone working on it. So I just looked in the internal website of my mm -hmm. university of research groups and I emailed uh, a, another young professor there. And I just said, can I have a chat? You're in office one building next to me and I have some ideas. And I went and it turned out my ideas were useless and crazy or people had done it and so on. But at least gradually you start to build the connections. And if you do it within your own institute, it's not that scary because mm -hmm. they're just colleagues especially if you go to other young people, they're open to this. It might take a bit of time, but starting inside your own institution, just having a chat, sharing ideas, you will always find people willing to listen to you for half an hour or an hour, and it builds up like this. Yeah, that's yeah. easiest. Thanks. And, and through them, you will get to know other people from their network and so on once it gets going. Yes, yes, of course. Okay. Any other question, Marco? Yeah, so in the, in the past, uh, I, I did a lot of uh, uh, industrial projects uh, or technology transfer projects. And uh, my experience with those kind of projects, uh, uh, maybe because I, uh, these projects were on the critical path of, uh, of the company we were collaborating with, were pretty tough. Yes, And yes. Uh, during the, that, that, that period, uh, it was really hard for, at least for me, to... Uh, to work on uh, research and think on uh, new new ideas. Although uh, those kind of projects were posing me new problems, new interesting problems that will uh, um, say uh, direct my future research. But uh, that period, I remember it as a nightmare. What is your experience <laughs> in this? <laughs> yeah, I agree. They can be tough. Um, I, my recommendation there is uh, you have to be a bit lucky with the industrial partners you work with and maybe also manage expectations in the beginning. If I go to a company comes to me and they uh, ask for a specific research problem and, 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 and topic and so on, the first thing I tell them is don't use us to design your next product. We are not good in this. I, my, my, my people cannot make good scan chains and testable designs and so on. We don't make products. But what we can do is de-risk your next product. So we can try out a couple of things, explore and give you the right insights to get a kickstart on your next project uh, and on your next product. But don't put us in the critical path. So I think managing expectations is important. 
companies should know that universities are not good at this. We, they can do it better than we can. Uh, on the other hand, of course, you do have to deliver, even in, in, in the project that I described, you do have to deliver things to companies. Um, there, I try to put more senior PhD students on such projects, if I have them also postdoc, but I don't find them, so I take senior PhD students, such that I'm pretty, I trust them enough that they can do most of the company interactions and I also only have to intervene like once a month or if things go wrong or I, I don't have to give it my full focus. And that both the combination of the two helps for me. But I agree, sometimes you're unlucky and you land the project that really turns out differently than you hoped and yeah, it costs time. Yeah. But this is this research pipeline also, if of course, if you're in the situation, you can have a bit of all types of projects. It limits the amount of industrial engagements you have to go and, and, and you can still have the good ideas from the industrial projects, but you don't have to spend all your time on them. I uh, see there is one other question in the chat. Uh, how much uh, experience does one need to be considered as a competent PI for, from the jury? You know, uh, yeah, it depends on the grant, eh? how much, if you have an ERC starting grant, it is, um, you can only be less than seven years after your PhD defense, so you don't need much ex experience. So it depends on the grant, uh, but especially this ERC is pretty open to young people and, and you're not competing against the senior people. Even my, for example, my age index, my citation index was very low when I applied for the ERC. But the first time it was even horrible, okay. Second time it was still not very high. But then I explained why this was because I had spent some time in industry, because I changed fields. They're all very open to that. Especially these, I think these kind of high risk projects are people, they're even a bit more open to people with less, which are less an expert in one specific field because they're so looking for crazy ideas that can change and have big impact and, and change the world. So don't be afraid of your own inexperience. I think, yeah, it's, it's definitely worth a try. Maybe with FET it's a bit different. In FET they look at consortia and the strength of the consortium and there I think they do watch it. You need some senior professor then and team up with them. I do that a lot, eh? Team up with a more senior name in the field. They're happy with your youngster IDs and you're happy with their age index that is on your proposal and you can work together perfectly. So that's also another possibility. Okay, is there any other question from the audience? I don't see any other question. Okay. Okay, then uh, I think that's, uh, that's it. Um, okay. But just one, 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 one curiosity. Oh, yes. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, I, if, if I can. Um, so in, in the last period, uh, uh, I think it's uh, getting very hard to, to find people interested in research. Yeah. <laughs> because uh, industry is uh, attracting a lot of uh, young, uh, young students uh, even before they finish their, uh, their graduation or their, or their degree. So what would you, would you say to convince a student to continue the research uh, career? What I think is most or is most rewarding about an, a research career is that you are making yourself or you're educating yourself in such a broad field of skills. You have to, whatever research you do, you have to manage it yourself. You have to set your own deadlines, your own milestones, write your own papers, do your own background search. In my field, you have to make a chip and a measurement setup and deploy algorithms. You, you are learning such a broad set of skills, both technically and non-technically, that is really an education that pays off the rest of your life. If you go to industry, you, get a, you become an expert in a very dedicated, specific task. They, you're good at this, so they will pay you to do this because you're most beneficial to the company in that way. So you narrow yourself down quickly. 
when I, when I was young, I wanted to open up all my options, keep every option open. And this is a perfect start for that. So that I think is the, is the biggest plus of going in the research career. Even if later you want to go to industry, you're still better skilled to tackle that career. Yeah. Thank you. I completely agree. But <laughs> yeah, for me, I think refining researchers for a PhD, I still find them doable, but I have a tough time finding postdocs. Either they go to industry or they want to immediately become a professor and uh, I don't find them. <laughs> so if uh, anyone wants to come do a postdoc with me, let me know. <laughs> I think we are facing the same problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's hard. Well, it is what it is. Good, it was fun to do this. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry I uh, had a bit of longer talk than I... No, 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 it's fine. It's fine, we are perfectly... In time. Okay, I think we can conclude the meeting uh, here, right, Marco? Or... Yes. Mm -hmm. So thanks, Marian, for the presentation. And it was really a pleasure to have you here and um, talk and gather your experience on, on this. And uh, I hope that you enjoyed as well to uh, yes. give this talk. And yes, yes, it was also uh, inspiring. As you said, it's a bit different from the typical technical <laughs> talk, right? So it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, That's it's good. It's nice. It, comments in the chat. Uh, okay. Yeah. It's great that you organized this. I think it's a very unique uh, event. So that's, that's, that's nice. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Fantastic. Well, thanks a lot also from my side, Marianne, for accepting uh, giving this talk. Uh, and thanks everybody to attend uh, the talk. And, Let's keep in touch. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.